In this video, we're going to learn how to get started working with the job system in Unity 2019. We will cover what are jobs, how they are created, and just how much performance we can get by using them. Let's begin! Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey, and this channel is all about helping you learn how to make your own games with in-depth tutorials made by a professional indie game developer. So if you find the video helpful, consider subscribing. Okay, so first of all, the job system is one of the pillars of the new Unity Dots tech stack. If you want to learn more about Dots, check the link in the description for the video where I go over what it is, how it works, and what are the benefits. Essentially, Dots is composed of the C Sharp job system, the Burst compiler, and the Entity component system. I've also done a video covering how to get started working with ECS, so check that out after this video. Now, the goal with the job system is to make it easier for you to write multi-threaded code. As you know, most processors nowadays have multiple cores. This means that you can have several pieces of code working at the same time. So for example, if you have some pathfinding code, using a single thread, you would calculate the first path, then the second, then the third, and so on. Whereas with multi-threaded code, you can calculate multiple paths at the same time. However, multi-threaded code is also very tough to write and potentially very error-prone with many issues that are extremely difficult to debug. So the job system handles all of the behind the scenes stuff like creating and managing threads and all you need to do is create jobs and schedule them. So let's get started playing with the job system. First you need to be using Unity 2019 and then in here you go into window and open the package manager. As of this recording some packages are still in preview so go to advance and enable show preview packages. Here are all the packages and for the C Sharp job system you have in here the jobs package. Also related to it is the Mathematics package. This is a math library specific with performance in mind. And also up here you have the Burst compiler which works very closely with the job system and we're going to test it out in the end. Also related is the Collections package which allows us to use native collections, like for example native list and native array, which we're going to use in order to enable parallel jobs. And the other package related to dots is the Entity component system, which is right here on the Entities package. But in here, let's keep things simple and deal only with the jobs. All right, so that's it for our package setup. Now let's get to writing some code. So first, let's make a simple script to run our code. So a new C# -sharp script. This will be our testing. Let's make a game object to add our script. Testing and just drag our script. Okay. Okay. Now in here, let's first make a private void update for our testing. So in here, private void update. And for starters, let's just write a simple function that will take some time to compute. So in here, make a private void. Let's call this a really tough task. So this represents a tough task, like for example, some pathfinding. In here, let's just do some code that will take some time to execute. Okay, so all we're doing is running a certain calculation 50,000 times. This will ensure that this task takes enough time so we can analyze our code speed. And also this is the math library, which again is inside using .unity.mathematics. Now here on the update, let's call this function and let's test how long this function will take to execute. The time.realtime since startup holds the number of seconds since the start of the game. So we do that and then we calculate it afterwards. So here we do the time minus the start time multiplied by a thousand so we get it in milliseconds. So we should be able to see how long this task will take to execute. Let's see. Okay, here we are and here in our console we can see that it's taking around 6.6 .6 milliseconds. All right. So now that we have our simple testing code, let's convert this into a job. Now in order to make a job, we need to make a struct. Structs are different from classes in several ways, and the main thing is how a struct is a value type, whereas a class is a reference type. That means that when working with structs, we are working with a copy rather than a reference. So we have our struct, and in order to make it a job, we implement the iJob interface, which is up here on the using unity.jobs. Okay, here we need to implement the execute function. And now inside this function, we have the code that will be executed by the job. 
So in this case, let's just copy our really tough task. And in here, you can add whatever fields the job requires. So for example, if we required a public float for something, we would add it in here. But in this case, we don't need any extra fields. Okay. So now that we have our job defined, we need to create and schedule it. So we go up here. Let's make a function that will do the same, but as a job. So a private void, call it really tough task job. And in here, we create a new really tough job. Then we have our job instance. And in here, we just need to go into job and call schedule. This tells the job system to schedule this job to be completed by an available thread when possible. Then this function returns a job handle, which is very important to keep track. So let's return the job handle from this function. Return a job handle. Okay, so all we're doing is creating a new job, which is a struct, and we schedule it on the job system. Now in order to execute our job, Let's go here on our update. We call the really tough task job, which returns a job handle. And then in order to tell the job system to complete our job, we call job handle dot complete. Calling this essentially pauses the main thread until the job has been completed and then the main thread continues. Okay, so that's it for making a very simple job. You define a struct that contains all the information and the behavior for the job. Then you create an instance of that struct. You schedule the job on the job system. And then you tell the job system to complete that particular job. So let's see what benefits we get with this function compared to this function. So let's add a really easy way of testing both methods. Up here, let's add a serialized field for a private bowl use jobs. Then here we do an if, if we want to use jobs, then let's do this. And if not, let's do the normal function. All right, that should do it. Let's test. Okay, so here we are and there's our Boolean field. As you can see, we are not using jobs right now and it's still taking the same 6.627 milliseconds. And now if we enable jobs and there you go, not much really changed. Now, the reason for that is because the whole point of multi-thread code is to do multiple things at once. Here, all we're doing is just a single task, so we're waiting for it to be completed on a separate thread. So that task will take the same amount of time whether it's on the secondary thread or on the main thread. So let's do a more appropriate test to see the actual benefits from jobs. So this function is meant to represent something really tough, like for example, some pathfinding. So up here, instead of calling it just once, let's assume we are calculating the path for 10 different units. So in here on our normal code, let's just do a four. So here we are pretending that we are calculating some pathfinding for 10 different units. And let's also do the same thing on our job. However, in here, we need to make sure that first we create all the jobs and only then we tell them to complete. Otherwise we would be creating a job and then waiting for it to complete before doing the next one and so on. So essentially this would be single thread. So what we need to do is first define all of them and then complete all of them. So in order to do that, let's make a collection to hold all of our job handles. So in here we do using unity.collections. This allows us to go down here and use a native list. Let's make a list of job handles. In here for our native list, we have to pass in the allocator. Essentially, we're telling what we're going to use this list for. In this case, we're only going to use it to set up our jobs, so we can use temp. Now in here, we create our job, we get the job handle, then we add it to our list. So job list, and we add our job handle. And then we don't call complete in here, but rather out here, we go into the job handle to call the static function complete all, and we pass in the list of all of our jobs. So the job handle list. So this tells the job system to complete all of the jobs on this list. And when they are done, we go back in here onto the main thread. And now in here, when using native arrays or native lists, we need to make sure to dispose of them. So after this, we do job handle list and we call dispose. All right, so now we have set up a more appropriate test. We're doing multiple tough tasks in the same frame. So in the normal way, we simply run this function 10 times, so one after the other. And in this way, we create 10 jobs and then we tell all of those jobs to be completed. Okay, let's see the results. So here we are, and we are now doing 10 tasks. So as you can see, instead of taking six milliseconds, we are taking 67, okay? 
Now if I enable jobs, and there you go, all of a sudden it's taking 15 instead of 65 milliseconds. So right there you can already see a pretty massive performance boost. We can open up the profiler to see exactly what is going on. So go into Window, Analysis, and open the profiler. Here is our profiler. Let's see what is going on without jobs. So disable jobs, and as you can see, that's how much longer it is taking. So let's pause and look at a frame. Here we have our main thread, and as you can see, it is taking 70 milliseconds on our testing.update. And if you open up the jobs, you can see that they are all just idle. Now let's resume and enable jobs. And there you go, as you can see, it went all the way down. And now we can stop and inspect one frame. And there you go, you can already see that it's occupying much less time, only 15 milliseconds. And here you can see all the jobs and how are they being assigned. You can see each of them is doing its own task, and you can see that several of them are being done at the same time. How many worker threads Unity creates will depend on your CPU. In my case, I have an Intel 6700K, which has eight logic cores, so in here you can see six threads plus whatever else Unity needs. So just like this, you can already see a pretty massive performance boost. However, there's still another thing which provides another huge boost pretty much for free. So let's go back to our code. And in here, we want to use the burst compiler. Now, in order to do that, it's extremely simple. We just go here using unity.burst. And then all we need to go is to our job definition right here. And before it, we add the attribute burst compile. And that's it. That's all it takes in order to enable burst compile on this job. So let's see our code. So here we are back on the normal code. And as you can see, taking 67 milliseconds. Now we enable jobs. And there you go. Now it's taking 15 milliseconds. And now for the last one, we go in here into jobs, burst, and enable. And let's see how much it goes down. And there you go. <laughs> it goes down from 15 milliseconds down to 0 0.03 milliseconds. So as you can see, that's a massive performance boost by just taking a box. Obviously, how much of a boost you get will depend on what exactly you're doing. But as you can see, for mathematical functions, this is insanely fast. All right, so this clearly shows you the massive performance you can get by using jobs to run your code in many threads. So now that we have covered the basics of our job system, let's see what other interfaces we have. So one of the interfaces is a simple iJob. And then you also have the iJob parallel for. This is meant when you have a job that you want to execute on elements inside a list. So let's create a simple test. We're going to create a bunch of units, put them in a list, and then do a job that runs on elements of that list. So let's do that. So we're going to instantiate a bunch of zombies and put them on that list. We're using this class in order to hold our transform and a move wise speed. Let's create them. Okay, so here we have some code running a thousand times. So we're going to instantiate a thousand zombies, put them on a random position, and then we add them to the list containing a reference to the transform and a random value for the move Y speed. So since we're using a serialized film, let's go into the editor. And here, just drag our prefab. And here, as you can see, the prefab is extremely simple. We just have a simple sprite render. So let's run the code and see if all of them are being spawned. And yep, there they are. We have a thousand zombies being spawned, okay. Now we want to make some code in order to move them up and down. So let's see. Back here in our script, let's go on to the update. And for now, let's comment out our previous test. And here, first, let's do it the normal way without using jobs. So we cycle through all the zombies. And here we want to move the transform based on the move Y. Then if he gets to the top of the screen, we want him to move down, and if the bottom, we want him to move up. Okay, so when we reach the top of the screen, we set it to negative. When we reach the bottom, set it to positive. Okay, so we should be able to see the zombies going up and down. All right. So this is some really simple movement code. Now, in order to test our code speed, let's also add our really tough task in order to make sure that this simple function takes some time to compute. Okay, so this is our test. Let's try it out. 
And yep, here we have our thousand zombies moving up and down, and as you can see, it is taking around 140 milliseconds per frame. All right, so now let's see how we can do this much more efficiently using parallel jobs. So here in our code, let's make a different job. So we create a new struct, so a public struct. And in here, instead of implementing ijob, we implement ijob parallel 4. So here is the definition. As you can see, we have our execute function that also receives an index. So let's implement that. So here we have our same execute function. And essentially, each time this function is called, it will be called on a different index. So now let's copy all of our code down there. OK, copy this. Now in here, you can obviously already see all of these errors. Essentially, we need to pass in the data that the job will need to execute. And since jobs don't work on the main thread, we cannot use the transforms directly. So it's here that we need to think of exactly what data are we modifying. And the answer is we are modifying a position and a move y. So we go up here and make a public float for our move y. And then we create a public float 3 for our position. Now the float 3 is from the super efficient mathematics class, which is pretty much just a vector 3. Here you can inspect the definition, and as you can see, we have an x, a y, and a z. Okay, so let's use these two variables in our code. So here we are using the position and the move y. However, remember that this is a parallel job. The goal is for this job to run on a list of items. That is why we have our index in here. So instead of receiving a single position and a single move y, we want to get an array. So in here, we receive a native array of float3. This will be our position array, and also a native array of floats for our move y array. And now here in the execute, we can use our index. And just like that. So every time this executes with a different index, we're going to modify a different position in our array. Now, one more issue that we have in here is you have to remember that jobs do not get run on the main thread. So that means we cannot access the normal Unity components. So in here, we cannot access time.delta time inside this job. That means we have to pass it in when we create the job. So in here, we make a public float for the delta time. And this is the one that we're going to use. Okay, so this is our simple parallel job created. Now we need to create, schedule, and complete it. So let's go up here into our update. And first, let's do the same thing using if in order to run our Javafy code or normal code. And now here, let's first create our job. And here we fill in our job values. So for example, the delta time, since this code is being run on the main thread, in here we pass in the time dot delta time. And then we need to pass in the position array. So let's create it up here. So we are creating a position array and a move array using a native array. And on the allocator, we're using temp job since we're going to be using these inside a job. And now obviously, since we are instantiating an array, it is completely empty. So we need to fill it up with our current data. So we cycle through all of our zombies and we pass in the position array with our transform position and the move y with our move y. So now with those arrays being filled, we can now pass them into our job. And just like that, our job now has all of its fields. So we can now go into the really tough parallel job and call our schedule. Now in here, as you can see, we need to pass in our array length, which in this case, it's our zombie list.count. And then we also need to know the size of each job batch. So this value is going to depend a lot on what you're trying to do. Essentially, this is how many indexes each job will be responsible for. So in our case, we're trying to run our job on a thousand zombies. So let's send each job to handle a hundred. Okay, so just like our normal job, this returns a job handle. So we have our job handle and just like the normal job, we call it dot complete. So this won't pause the main thread until our parallel jobs has been completed. And that's it for our job. We create our arrays, we fill it up with whatever variables we need, we create a job instance, we schedule our job and we tell it to complete. Now since we are executing our job on a duplicate piece of data, that means that after the work has been done, we need to update our original values. 
So we do another cycle. So after the values have been calculated, we update them on our original transform and the original move one. Now, if you were using this sort of code in a specific part of your game, you would just create these native arrays once and then use them every time instead of instantiating a new one every time. However, for this simple example, let's stick with this simple approach. So we create our temporary arrays and then we update our original values. Now again, since these are native arrays, we need to make sure to dispose of them. So in here we call the position array, call dispose, and same thing on the move one. All right, that should do it. So here we have our normal code, and here we have our Jobify code. So now that we've done all of this, now we can finally view all of our benefits. Okay, so here we are with our thousand zombies just moving around, and as you can see, 140 milliseconds. Now let's enable jobs. And there you go, it goes from 140 milliseconds to just 40 milliseconds. So if we disable jobs, our scene is running at 7 frames per second. Enable jobs. And our scene is running at 25 frames per second. So just like that, you can see a massive performance boost on moving a thousand entities independent from one another. So again, like we did, let's look at the profiler. So here we have running our code without the job system. Let's inspect one. And as you can see, we have just our testing.update and all of our worker threads are completely idle. And now let's enable jobs. And here, as you can see, we have our jobs being invoked on our multiple threads. So uh, you can already see some massive performance boost. Now again, let's check out the magical burst compiler. In order to enable it, it's very simple. We just need to add our attribute to our job. So here we have our scene running on normal code. We're taking 140 milliseconds, okay. Now enable jobs, and there you go, go down to 140, down to 40 milliseconds per frame. And now enable the burst compiler. Let's go here, burst enable, and let's see, it goes from 40, and there you go, down to four milliseconds. So without jobs, 140 milliseconds, with jobs plus the burst compiler, and it's four milliseconds. So just like that, you can see the insane improvements you can get from the job system and the burst compiler. Now, one last thing, let's look at parallel jobs specifically for transforms. So for that, first we go up here and make sure that we are using unity engine.jobs. And now we can go down here to make another job, our public struct. And in here we can implement ijob parallel for transform. This is a specific parallel job that works on transforms. Here, as you can see, we got our execute function, which receives an index and also a transform access. And the transform access essentially duplicates a transform, but it does so in such a way that we can use it inside our jobs. So now in here, let's do our code the same as on this job. Except now we no longer need the position array. Instead, we modify this transform directly. And now let's see how we create this new type of job. In here, instead of having this job, let's comment this out. And here you can see that this function on schedule, we require our transform access array. So we need to fill that up. So instead of using our original position array, we are using a transform access array and filling it up with our references. We schedule it using this transform access array. And after the job completes, again, the transform is automatically updated. So we no longer need the position. We just need to update our move one. All right, so that's it. As you can see, this is a very specific job for working with normal transforms. And finally, we need to go into the transform access array and call dispose. Let's also add the burst compile attribute to make it insanely fast. Okay, let's see. So again, here we have our normal code. Everything still works the same, 140. Enable jobs and it's down to 40. And enable jobs plus the burst compiler and we go down to four and everything works perfectly fine. And we can look at the profiler. Here we are on the profiler, and as you can see, our code is running extremely fast, the whole thing in just 1.36 milliseconds. 
Everything else is the editor loop. And you can see here all of the workers and all of them doing all of that transform work in here. As you can see, we have 16 instances and each of them is taking 0.021 milliseconds. So in this video, we just covered the C sharp job system. You can get even more performance by combining the entire dot stack. So the job system with the burst compiler working with the entity component system. With all of them put together, you can get hundreds of thousands of units on screen. So make sure you subscribe to the channel for upcoming ECS tutorials using the complete dot stack with the job system and the burst compiler just to see how much performance we can squeeze out of this new awesome tech stack. I hope this video helped you understand how to get started making jobs and the massive performance boost you can enjoy. As always, you can download the project files and utilities from unitycodemonkey.com. If you like the video, subscribe to the channel for more Unity tutorials. Post any questions you have in the comments and I'll do my best to answer them. Alright, see you next time.